All right. Hello, gentlemen. So as you know, we've actually moved into trying a different hybrid um, class um, structure. I'm trying to find how successful we can really be. Um, but over the last two days, as you know, we've had some internet issues and connecting with um, virtual lab partners has not been as successful as I hoped. And so to curb that, I'm actually taking a page out of a fellow teacher's book of what they're doing with the hybrid. And so we're going to be trying this, which is new. Um, I do ask again for your patience, but I'm hoping that this will be a lot more successful. Um, so the plan is, is that if you are here in person, you will be participating in labs and taking some notes. We might do some examples, um, but those of you that are online, you will be going over notes. Um, I will have activities ready, and then you'll be making, um, doing homework assignments, and I'm also giving um, extended deadlines for homework assignments, which I'll talk about more um, on our Zoom call. So you're coming from the Zoom call today. If you need any reminders, please let me know. However, I do plan on posting an announcement with this information. So for today's lecture, we're gonna be going over measurement. Um, so we're gonna be doing notes over measurement and then you'll have some math um, examples. So I ask that you have a notebook, a pencil, a calculator, um, for today's sake, if you do not have a scientific calculator, such as the one that I have, um, make sure that you get one. On the off chance you forget it, I do have calculators for you to borrow. However, especially being COVID friendly, have your own calculator. Um, and then you will have a homework assignment to work on after this lecture. And it's called Measurements in Science. And I'll show you how to access that uh, following this lecture. So to begin, taking notes on paper, you will always title it with a heading of a date, the unit, and then the topic title. So in this case, the topic title is measurements in science. And so you will have the date. Today's date is the 26th. For those of you viewing it at a later date, it is not the 26th. Um, so make sure to record that. Put unit one, measurements in science. So measurements in science can go from volume, we can measure with mass, and we will also measure in length. Um, measurements in science are always using the metric system, so I'll have a table for you to copy here shortly. So when we measure volume, we always measure in milliliter. When we measure in mass, we're always measuring in grams, and we always measure with a ruler in centimeters. And if you use inches or Fahrenheit or pounds, um, you do have to go through a lot of steps to make those the correct units, and so it is in your best interest to automatically measure in the metric system for science classes. Right here is our um, table of what we measure in. So the more the precise the tool, the better the measurement. So the tool that you could use for mass is called a balance. So it's our mass balance and it measures in grams. Another tool is our graduated cylinder, which was used for volume, and that can be in liters or milliliters. Our temperature is used with a thermometer and it's always in Celsius. Our length is in meters, so M, we can use a meter stick or a ruler. And then our time, which is our seconds, is always used with a timer. So write this table down, pause this video, copy it in your notes. This might come back up on a quiz. All right, so right now I ask that you measure this line segment and give me your best guesstimate on what you think that is. It's a little difficult to see um, because you can't tell there's not little ticks in between. So I could make a guesstimate and say, oh, maybe 3.25, like three and a quarter uh, centimeters. You always add units at the end of your line segment uh, measurement in this case. So I'm going to say three and a quarter. Now I could use this ruler or... I could use this ruler, and that gives me a more accurate answer as to what that measurement was because I have those ticks that allow me to show what my estimated value is. So the difference between this ruler and this ruler is the addition of the extra measurement increments. 
The adjustments that I had to make now is that I have a more accurate measurement because I can use those ticks to give what I believe the result is. So I talked about estimated, which is our uncertain digit for a second there. That is the final digit of a measurement that is done in lab. So it's one decimal place past the smallest division on the measuring divide that you see. So because you estimate, the value is always uncertain because it's what you think that number is. And so what I think could be different than what you think, especially in this case. So in this situation, when I look at this line segment, I can provide at least 0.1 of a decimal place. So I'm going to use a board. Cool. So I know for a fact that line falls between 3 and 4. So it has to be 3. But then I can make an estimate about what I believe it lands. So I think maybe like 3.2. Five. I can give two decimal places as my estimate. Because I have that middle line dividing it in half for me. So I can quarter it up. But I can only really quarter it up in that situation. So if you did not feel like comfortable with this second one, you don't have to. You can just give me a 3.2 estimate. However, when I move here, I can very certainly give you a better estimate with two decimals because I have the addition of these ticks. So I can go through and say, all right, I know it's three. I go one, two, and I go, okay, I think there's a two, it's a 3.2. And then I estimate from there. So I look and I go, okay, because there's imaginary 10 ticks between those lines, I'm going to say 3.22. Those are my estimates, but I can give a better estimate about what I believe that measurement is because I have that additional information to make my estimate with my measuring device. Um, that's why you can give a more accurate estimate because when I'm measuring here, I can give you a really better sense of my estimate Whereas here, I'm making a broader judgment because I don't have the addition of those ticks that are in between, um, much like I have on this ruler. And again, I measured at 3.22 for that line. You could say, I thought it was like 3.25, you know, closer to that. That's fine. It's your estimate. It's uncertain, so there's no um, exact right or wrong when you're making an uncertain estimate. Okay, so you're gonna be doing this in our lab this week. However, it's important to know how to measure volume. So in a 100 milliliter beaker, you have a pretty straight line, so you're able to follow that way. Similar to our ruler, you would measure the water um, by using your estimate. And again, because I can um, estimate a better sense, I can at least go to one decimal place. With my 50 milliliter graduated cylinder, I'm going to read it at where this meniscus is. That's where my dip happens in my cylinder, and that's where you measure your volume. You will never measure the volume using these sides because that's an inaccurate measurement. You will always use the meniscus to measure. So in this case, for the meniscus, I can go up and say, I believe it's 20 and then 0.4, and I'm gonna say 0 0.40 because it's right on that line. So I can give a two decimal estimate for that one, whereas on the beaker, I can say, I think that's, 48 um, because I don't have the addition ticks. So my 8 is my estimated value, whereas my 4 was my I'm certain that this is a 40, and then I estimate from there. How to read volume. So helpful tips and tricks for you. I always recommend when you're reading volume in the lab to use a, oh, I don't have a plain, plain white sheet of paper, just something as a backdrop. And you'll hold that, I'm gonna use my glass jar, 
pretend this is filled. I will hold that and then using my measurements, it just gives me a better sense on how to read it, especially because I can get a better sense on where the meniscus, meniscus is when I'm measuring the volume. When you measure volume, make sure it's always at eye level. So I typically put my jar on the table, I'll put a piece of white paper, and I lower myself. That way I can see the meniscus, because if I'm standing above it, it's going to be a warped sense of a measurement. So I'm not getting an accurate measurement. So to do that, you have to get at eye level. And when you are in using the beaker, you always count up. You never count down. So even if you're making an estimate, you're always going to do the higher, don't do lower. All right, so this is my checkpoint for you. I want you to measure this new line segment and give me your estimated values with it. Okay. Let's talk about it. So when I look at this line segment, I always try to like make it easier and break it up so I have an easier way to digest the information. I look at this ruler and I can see that that line at least exceeds past four. So I know I have four centimeters and now I make my estimates. I believe it looks like it falls at least by the one, so I have 4.1. And now I'm going to make my estimated digit for that second decimal place because I have those ticks existing in between. I think I see that as a 1.4. My 4 is my estimated value, and so I underline that for myself to note, and then I always add my units at the end. When you measure volume, you're going to do the meniscus. So practice this right now and record your answers on your piece of paper. Perfect. For the first volume, I am going to measure where the meniscus is. So in this case, here is my meniscus. I know with that, it's above at least 10. The ticks give me the fives, so I know it's under um, my ten, like 15 mark. So I know I'm going to have my one. I know it's less than 15. I would say it looks like 14 where the meniscus is at. And actually... I believe the meniscus dips a little, so it looks more like a 13.9 milliliter measurement where my 13 and my 9 are my estimated values. But predominantly my 9 is my estimate. My 13 is still a rough estimate of where I think it's at, but I can tell at least it's below 14 in my opinion, so it has to be 13. Yeah, so sorry. Next is the other measurement. And so I look at this and it goes in ticks of fifth, like fives. So five, 20, 25. So I have the ticks in between. So I follow my meniscus right here. There's 15, 16, 17. Here's my 18 mark. Again, I feel like that meniscus falls under my 18 mark. And so I am going to give another 17.9 milliliters, where my 9 is my estimated value. If you believed it was 18, you would always do 0, 0.0, because that 0 is your estimated value. Our next um, graduated cylinder volume is similar. So here's our meniscus. We have our measurements. So again, it's above 40. It's in ticks of one up. I'm going to keep it easy. I see that as 42.0 milliliters, where my O is my estimated value. And then for my next one, see, it's a little bit more difficult now because I'm moving into 
less estimated territory. So I have 75 and I hop up 25 up to 100. So these are in five. So I have 80, 85, 90, 95. So right here I have 90. And again, I believe that's underneath. So I would say 89.9 milliliters where my 9.9 .9 is my estimate. Typically, you're always going to give at least one decimal place when you're estimating these values. Next, we're going to be measuring mass with balances. So based on our discussion earlier, which number represented is the estimated number? So take a moment to answer that. So when I look at my mass balance, it actually is the 2.87. The 7 is my estimated value because it's something that can change, especially when you're using a mass balance. Your balance might teeter on that number because it's trying to estimate what the value would be, where it can for certain say that 2.8 is the mass. It's that second decimal it's trying to evaluate and estimate. When you're measuring temperature, I want you to give me your estimated number for this, temp this thermometer that's right here. So take a moment to answer that question. Perfect. So it's in the ticks, so I can give at least one decimal place. So I know it's above 60. I believe it's under 63, so I'm going to give it a 62.7, 62 62.8. 62 that a range where my 0.8 is my estimated value. When you measure temperature, um, always get eye level with the thermometer, and I always recommend using a white piece of paper as well behind it. Always make sure that the thermometer is never touching the inside of the glass. It will affect your results, and so you always want to kind of hold it up so it's in the um, temperature, like in the sample that you're measuring the temperature with. And then when you're done with your thermometer, you're always going to store it upright in the holder that I have in the lab. And you'll actually have an opportunity to measure with a thermometer and practice putting it away correctly, as well as how to use it correctly in the lab. All right, so now we're moving into our percent error. I'm going to move my camera. So our percent error is something that we use to calculate accuracy in a lab. And it's always found where our calculated value is subtracted from our actual value and divided by the actual value and multiplied by 100. So I'm going to do this practice problem with you. In the lab, you calculate the density of a liquid to be 1.24 grams over milliliters, where the actual value is 1.30 grams over milliliters. What is the percent error? So, in this problem, I am given, give me a minute, oh, I don't want to use the pen, here we go, I am given, I calculate the density, so I calculated the number that's right here, so if I calculated this number, I'm going to plug it into my calculated value, so I'm going to set this up, So my calculated value, excuse me, I'm going to write 1.24, and I always put my units with it. You always want it together. And I, that's the only place I have to put my calculated value. Next, the information it gives me is my actual value, and it's 1.30 grams of milliliter. This is my actual value number, so I'm going to plug that in to where... It says so on my um, outline. So your problem should end up looking like this. Next, you are going to break it down and you're going to solve. So your first step is you will take 1.24 and minus 1.30 from it. Plug this into your calculator and write your answer on top.
of the decimal. You still have your units. Now I should have something like negative 0 0.06 over 1.30 times 100. My next step is to take that value I solved for and divide it by the um, actual underneath. When you're solving for these problems, always, 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 um, excuse me. Always keep all of your decimal places for the most accurate answer. If you do not, you want to maintain at least three decimal places throughout the entirety of the problem. You never round until you complete the math equation um, because it can alter your numbers and it will give you something wonky. So like we're calculating for our percent error, for you not to have any error in your numbers, maintaining all your decimal places is extremely important. When I divided these, um, my units canceled out. So now I have a unitless um, like number. So I end up with negative 0 0.04615 I simplified it there. So I wrote it down three, so I don't have to write it out. However, write this entire number out. And then you're going to multiply that by 100. And you should end up with negative 4.6. 6.2%. Which I know you're going to say, Mrs. McCaslin, you can't have a negative percent. However, when you're calculating your percent error, you can because it's showing us that we made an underestimate on our calculated value. So it means that we were under what the actual value was. There are two types of error. We have a positive percent error, our negative percent error, which we just saw our negative percent error. Our overestimated from the actual value is our positive. It means we had too much because we didn't, when we subtracted, we did not have a negative. Our underestimated is our negative value, because our negative percent error, because when we're subtracting a number that's smaller than our bigger number, we always end up with the negative. So having a negative percent error is fine because it's showing that you made an underestimate in your calculated value. All right, let's do some practice. So you take a minute to work on this and then I will come in and I will complete it. Um, make sure to write your answer down and then we'll discuss. Perfect. Okay, so I look at this data and I see that a student measures that a piece of string is 2.6 centimeters, but the actual length of the string is 2.9 centimeters. What is the student's percent error? So I have my actual value being my 2.9 centimeters, and what I measured, excuse me, is my calculated value Okay, cool, <laughs> which is my 2.6 centimeters right there. So I'm gonna plug this into my percent error equation. This is horrendous, but that's fine. So I plug in my calculated where my calculated goes. I put in my actual Always keep my units, and I'll multiply that by 100. My next step is I'm going to take 2.6 minus 2.9 in my calculator. I end up with negative 0 0.3 centimeters. I'll put that over my 2.9.
centimeters, multiply it by 100. Cool. I'll then take that number and my negative 0 0.3 and divide it by my 2.9. I end up with a long decimal of 0 0.1034487276. Multiply that by 100. I'm going to write on the board for the next problem. And I end up, because I can round now to two decimal places, with 10.34%. And that's my answer. So you should end up with negative 10.34%. Again, you'll have errors with calculating in the chance that you do not use all of your decimal places um, when solving. Okay, I'm going to write on my board for this one. So a standard mass of 100 grams was placed on a balance. There we go. The balance indicated that the mass was 101.6 grams. What was the percent error for the balance? So take a moment to solve for that. So... Our standard mass of 100 grams is our calculated value. And the reason why is that's what our standard mass is. It's something that they calculated. However, when they put it on the balance, they realized it was 101.6 grams. So that was our actual um, grams, that was our actual mass, not our calculated mass. So, we will now plug it in to our equation. We get something like this. Again, I will do my steps. Plug the first ones in my calculator to get negative 1.6 grams. I divide my one, negative 1 1.6 by 101.6. And I get a value of 0.01574. Eight zero oh, three one. I multiply that value by a hundred. I round two decimal places. I get the number um, negative one point five seven four eight zero three one five. Because um, the third decimal over is a 4, I am not rounding my 7 up. So I get an answer of negative 1.57%. All of these that we studied were underestimates. Um, so that's why we had negative values. However, make sure when you are plugging in your values in your calculator with negatives, if you need to, um, always, always, always use this negative button that is in the bottom of your calculator. Never, ever, ever use your minus button. You'll never get a negative number because it tries to subtract it, and so you'll have an error. So always use the negative button in case you need to add a negative number. I'm sorry. So now all that I have for you to do is I need you to have all your supplies by next class, and I need you to complete the Making Measurements in Science worksheet that's found on Canvas. 
Um, it is my understanding, I uploaded a PDF that you should put this in Notability and you can write on it. However, if you're having technical issues, I suggest that you write on a separate piece of paper and then report or record it into our text box that's located on Canvas and I'll understand what you mean. So that is all I have for you today. So now take this time to go work on the Making Measurements in Science worksheet, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.